Hi, George, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, you good to be me, here. What's your name? Who are you? And uh, what's going on? Uh, my name is George Barder. I'm, I guess, loosely speaking, a campaigner and activist. And what's going on? Um, we're exponentially destroying the world. Um, you know, that was the case 50 years ago. It's just we're now at a point where that's unbelievably critical and destructive. Um, and meanwhile, 40 years of neoliberalism that doesn't seem to get challenged in terms of whether it's been like a good thing or not um, seems to be like okay. going on yeah. unabated. Um, okay. But yeah, um, but there's a, there's a weird sort of dissonance, right? I think the the awareness of how like systemic and hugely scale of the problems that we have are is greater than it has been for a long time. But equally, like the the concentration of wealth and power that is driving the problem is, is seems sort of more intact than ever for the moment. Um, yeah. So it's an interesting historical moment, I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions. Firstly, about um, the politics of inconvenience. It's a term I've just coined, probably coined by someone else as well. Um, we were talking before about how um, about how nurses in the media are possibly being depicted. Some, you said there was an article in the paper where they were saying that just off oil protesters and nurses are almost being depicted as making life difficult for everyone. Can you, can you talk about that? Oh, no, I mean, the, the article I was talking about was, it was in The Independent, um, either today or yesterday, but, but making a, a positive argument in favour of both, saying, like, we seem to have forgotten the basic reason for protest, which is that you know, people are driven to a point where only by disrupting the normal running of things can they remotely have an influence, right? Like, it's, it's nurses w working collectively to do something that is hugely disruptive that gives them meaningful agency in terms of taking the action. Similarly with Just Stop Oil, you know, we all know as activists we've been doing, you know, we're always told we need to target the government. We target the government constantly, you know, but it hardly gets any attention, right? You know, we've targeted the banks, that doesn't get much attention either. It's only when you disrupt the smooth running of the status quo in some significant provocative way that you actually bring attention to the thing that needs attention bringing to it. And in the case of Just Stop Oil, obviously you're talking about this. I, I think most people don't really have a sense of, you know, what, why we're saying no new licenses. Um, the UK government, as the president of the global COP process at this unbelievably critical time where the world scientists are saying we've basically run out of time to turn everything around, the UK government itself commissioned a report last year from the International Energy Agency to inform the Glasgow negotiations of which we were the president. Um, and the headline categorical conclusion of that report was that there can be no new fossil fuel licences. Um, in concluding that, they were simply backing up the IPCC report that had come out earlier in the year that said exactly the same thing. And months later, because Ukraine apparently, we're giving out over 100 new licences. And so a bunch of activists that are terrified for their future, especially young people, have said this has to be a line in the sand that we can't cross. And you know, the media is not holding the government to account for their complete failure to do what the scientists say is necessary to have any meaningful chance of, of a viable future. Because it's not like we stop the new licenses and we're fine. That is just the, the, the very first thing we should be doing. And, and to put this in a bit of wider context, there was a report I think that came out just before the Paris Agreement, um, in, you know, so, so this was 2015, saying the infrastructure set to be underway by 2017 embodies two degrees of warming. So that was before like the, the many years of activism from you know, people in the global south, especially in the, the COP process, had actually got to a point in, you know, in the Paris Agreement where 1.5 was, was put in the text. Back then we were still talking about two degrees. So we were basically all, almost at a point where our infrastructure was going to commit to two degrees and we're still commissioning more and more and more infrastructure six years later, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's absolute madness that they're doing this. But like I say, the media is not holding them to account, the opposition party is not holding them to, the, to account. So it's down to activists to do things that are sufficiently disruptive in order to try and get some airtime for this stuff. But of course, it's, it's a very inefficient way of doing it when almost all the media seems dedicated to making sure that the story is about a bunch of selfish people who seem to want to disrupt other people for no good reason, rather than actually talking to them about why they're taking these incredibly, you know, increasingly desperate acts. Um, and the answer is obvious, right? Like the, the world's scientists are saying that the physics of this problem, I mean, it's physics, biology and chemistry actually combined, um, but means that unless we stop the new licenses and bring about a root and branch transformation of our economies and societies, to quote the recent United Nations Environment Report, um, you know, unless we do that, then there's no chance of avoiding accelerating 
climate and ecological disaster. You know, that's, that's where we are at in 2022. Um, so, of course, you know, more than ever, um, you know, the power system is, is dedicated to trying to shoot the messenger with every single weapon they can possibly get their hands on so as to eclipse the message as, as desperately as they can. But the message is getting through. You know, we're, we're at this point of dissonance where, on the one hand, most of us seem prepared to kind of go along with the status quo and kind of, you know, can be... Um, can be sort of shepherded into into kind of you know having a go at the activists, but on the other hand, those same people get that this is a massive crisis. And in fact, the, the reason civil disobedience works, by the way, for anyone that's wondering, despite the fact the activists are unpopular, is that when they go on the news, um, there's usually sort of three people involved. There's the the activist, the person who's on the news to slag off the activist and and the interviewer. And what they all agree on apparently is that climate change is a massive problem. We should be doing more. Um, all they disagree on apparently is the you know disruptively selfish tactics that the activists are using. So in that in that very in that reality and oft repeated reality, in so much as they keep doing the disruptive things, then that brings to the news agenda the fact that this is a problem that is massive and we're not doing enough. Um, which is why it has to, you know, we have to keep doing it, but doing our best to be as skillful as possible in how we do it and how we talk about it, so as to bring as much attention as possible onto the thing that really matters. And, and that's not to say that the consequences of traffic are not real for people's lives. They are, and, and they are every single day, nothing to do with just up oil. There are traffic jams and ambulances get stuck and people can't get to really important things they're going to. But it is like stepping out from this, it's remarkable that suddenly the powers that be hugely care about all the, the, the touching and, and you know, upsetting consequences of traffic where they never seemed to before. Um, but they don't seem to care about what you know, in 20, 30 years time will be blindingly obvious. No one's going to be looking back and be like, well, these protesters, you know, maybe they were trying to prevent the destruction of life that's happening in front of us. But you know, people were being delayed. Obviously, no one's going to care about that. You know, similarly with the suffragettes, no one's saying, well, you know, but that shop owner in Oxford Street that had his window smashed, you know, he was struggling to pay his bills. You know, all of that was probably true, but nonetheless those actions by disrupting the status quo over and over forced the powers that be from the, the delay position they were at um, when the suffragette started, which was saying, oh yeah, no, no, we get it too, just leave it to us in good time, in good time, in good time. Um, and of course the change didn't happen until that provocative, disruptive action happened, which was slagged off by the mainstream press in exactly the same way as it is now, you know. So, yeah, I, I guess the point of going on about this is is to ask as many people as possible, really, to try and take as historical a perspective as possible on, on what's going on. Um, and I think if they do that, it's uncontroversial that even if you hugely disagree with the strategy, um, in so much as any attention is brought to the question of whether we should be licensing more like omnicidal fossil fuels at this point, um, you know, that that's the important thing to focus on. Um, and, and, you know, well, you see people on Twitter that will, you know, do something saying, well, because of these people, I'm going to go and, like, buy another burger or whatever. The vast majority of people are not because they're pissed off with activists, suddenly not going to care about the world being destroyed for their children, which is why, you know, it is a useful and effective thing to do. But it becomes more and more useful to the extent that the majority, more and more people in the public take the opportunity of conversations where that comes up to be a bit courageous because of how much kind of bullying there is in the mainstream inf informational space of activists. Um, you know, to actually have the courage to stand up and say, well, hang on a minute, you know, you may not agree with their tactics, but they are absolutely right. And if we don't agree with what they're doing, then what are we going to do to make it happen otherwise? Because the media won't make it happen otherwise. The corporations are, you know, greenwashing like the governments. Um, you know, so as usual, change is down to activists, but, but down to, to members of the public to be part of that critical mass of people um, to create the social tipping point where, you know, it becomes inevitable common sense that, that politicians have to respond to, that that change needs to happen. Okay, um, what I can do is I can uh, stop the video just before you take the swig, so that that whole thing I can just upload. Yeah, do you see what I mean? So I won't include the bit where you had the swig of water, because you actually stopped just before. So I'm going to include... I mean, I don't mind either way. I mean, I don't think really judge me for... No, 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 I'm just telling you because I've got different hats on. You know, one hat is just making sure you're in the shot. The other hat is making sure that I ask you a good question. The other cool. one is making sure you come back. And the other one is thinking, right, can I edit this? Yeah, good. Cool, cool, yeah. cool. So, um, yeah, uh, part of me wished it hadn't been such a long answer. But at the sure, same sure, time, sure. I know you, George, so it's all good. <laughs> it's all fine. And the thing is that you did start hitting um, everything that I asked. You know, so, you know, it just it just wasn't a thing where I was just like interrupting you and like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Um, 
what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask you a question. This is the question in a way. Go for it. Uh, it's in relation to... Um, you said um, that there's this whole thing of people attacking the messenger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, you know, I was listening. So yeah, yeah, when yeah. you were talking about how people will attack the messenger, and then afterwards you said, essentially, to the public, uh, look, I know there's a lot of temptation to attack the messenger, uh, but think of the wider context, think of historical things and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, when people are basically either not consciously on your side, Mm -hmm. anything like that then you saying think of the bigger picture is still hard to get through we're sure, just talking sure, about you know sure. how communication works sure, sure, sure. so um can you in a fairly slow way in, in the case of nurses unions for example mm -hmm. it was collective bargaining you know it was something that used to be able to work yeah, yeah, know, yeah in yeah, general yeah, yeah. and now clearly it's just not working in any sector or very few yeah, yeah and yeah, so yeah. that's one thing so you know with unions you had collective bargaining yeah, yeah, and then yeah. afterwards also as you said you have the strike itself yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so right now can you talk again about what is going on what do you want people that are reading the daily mail my favorite mm. paper and mm saying, look, this is happening, eco-zealots, all of this kind of stuff. Some people, for example, think tanks, which I have sometimes looked at, will say um, that environmentalism is displaced communism. It's just communism uh, under, the, under this thing. Yeah, you can have a right-wing environmentalist and all this kind of stuff, but that's what it is. So in a sense, it's Cold War. It's you guys undermining the state. Um, and at the same time, you know, one of my mates is saying that you work for MI6. So, you know, the thing is, so on the one hand, you've got, you know, what you're doing is you're trying to undermine the state itself, you know, government, you know, like sure. the running of the country. And on the other hand, it's, there's all spy cops going on and you're fucking one of them. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Look, firstly, uh, you don't have to address the question of whether or not you work for the government. You know? <laughs> there's also the other thing... Of, well, that'd be much easier if I did. I know, I'd, yeah. I'd be able to afford things. Yeah, well, I'm not going to make it that easy for you. The other thing is, of course, the thing about how... Um, <laughs> how paid activists as well, you know, like mm -hmm. being a full-time paid activist as well. So there are three different things here. You know, one is that a lot of people give money to, you know, Extinction Rebellion or whatever, maybe not a lot, but, you know, they're getting, mm -hmm. you know, they get funding. That's that one thing. And then afterwards, people have been talking about the contracts that people sign, you know, whatever it was. This beginning. Yeah. I mean, the idea of yeah. calling them contracts is just so, is so misleading. Sure. Right. So, so are you a cult? <laughs> is this uh, are we zealots are we are zealots you, are, you Ex are we extremists yeah do you no. love bomb people into the, into it is it guilt what's going on are you a cult what do you say to people who think that they're victims of your cult I don't mean in the cult I yeah, mean yeah, yeah. you know from stopped traffic yeah yeah, um, yeah. Uh, are there, what about the overlap between you and the government and, and certain aspects of the banks to do with some of the slogans about 1.5 degrees and things like that, you know, because they say they're green, net zero, you know, do you work for Bill Gates? All of these different questions. Oh, but there's, but you know, I mean, I want yeah. you to talk about them. I'm not going to not going to interrupt you anymore. No, 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 but, but by all means, inter I mean, in, yeah. interrupt me to, you know, push me in different directions. Yeah. But um, I mean, so going back to the shooting the messenger thing, right? Like, obviously, if they want to avoid the action that is required, namely, you know, taking taking tough political decisions, and that's you know back on the agenda, right? Because uh, I, I hope that most people watching this um, understand that tough political decisions is effectively like code for like punching down to poor people. You know, tough political decisions essentially means cutting benefits and all sorts of other things. I wish our politicians would actually take tough political decisions, namely standing up to finance and the fossil fuels. Because quite simply, unless we stand up to the financial industry and to the fossil fuel industry, we are toast as a, as a planet. Um, isn't that, but, and, but, and, but, and, and so... But hold on, isn't that... I'm, so, I'm just interrupting. Go, go, go. But, but isn't that also just playing into what I was saying of you're paid by the banks and the government and Bill Gates to basically say net zero, you know, and all of this type of stuff. But and it's the opposite, know, right? Like, it's the opposite. The, the point is that they're saying all this stuff, right? And so the, the, the reality of activism is the opposition to that. If, they, if them saying net zero 2050 and 1.5 to stay alive and World Economic Forum and all these meetings were actually doing anything and moving us remotely in the right direction, then we wouldn't be out protesting, you know, we wouldn't be out doing civil, I mean, to use the just a power language, civil resistance. We wouldn't be like fundamentally questioning the legitimacy of this government based on its 
you know, abject failure to take the, the necessary steps to protect people's right to life going forward. But are you That's what's going on. Okay, so, so, you, so, 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 to, so to address the, the propaganda around 1.5 and net zero and all the rest of it is that, you know, of course propagandists, their job is to take the things that are meaningful and try and dress up their response to those things um, in, a way, in a way that creates the impression that they have taken on board the truth that those, those things represent. So, okay. so to touch on 1.5, the truth that 1.5 represents, again, putting it in context, we're at 1.2 degrees now, we're at 1.2 degrees of warming now, and this you know, biblical level catastrophe is unfolding all the time, almost everywhere we look. You know, you don't have a week that doesn't have a, a climate disaster. Yeah, so hold so, on, hold so, on. so let, let, let me just join these dots quickly. Okay. So, so zooming out, right, it should be very, very clear that we should never have allowed the climate crisis to have got to the catastrophic state it has already got to. So in that context, we're at 1.2 already, we, we might potentially hit we're, we're the, well, um, the meteorological organization in the UK the Met, Met Office did, did a report saying we're very likely to have a, a we're, we're likely to have a year that is 1.5 degrees ho hotter in the next five years okay, anyway. George, and point. and so, so so the point is that 1.5 degrees correlates to a significantly greater level of catastrophic destruction, okay. not only that afflicts the lives of hundreds of millions of people, including now in the rich countries, but also threatens much greater destabilization of the of sure. the systems on the planet, which means feedback. So this is really this is don't, come on. Yeah, I, I, yeah, get no, the, no, I get that I get that you want to interrupt me, but it's really important that you don't interrupt me at this point because because 1.5 is just this this slogan that gets thrown around. Um, we're already seeing feedbacks in the system at less than 1.5. A report came out in Science earlier this year saying a whole bunch of other feedbacks come into play at about 1.5 degrees. And so, so that the world does everything that is humanly, reasonably, compassionately possible to avoid going above that level um, is absolutely vital to have any chance of a, of a stab at preventing this running away from us. Because as I say, there are feedbacks in the system already. So it is already an existential emergency. And until the world treats it as such, we're not gonna take anything like the action that's required. The good news about this emergency, by the way, which requires a wartime, a wartime style mobilization, is that instead of mobilizing to go and kill loads of people, what we need to mobilize for is creating a beautiful, breathable, fairer world where we actually do the same human things that we all try and embody when we you know, teach our children to be humans, namely sharing the stuff in a reasonable way, etc. You know. Um, so, so 1.5 you know, has to have, is a really important line in the sand in terms of getting there. Um, stopping the new licenses is the very, very first thing that we should have already done. George, yes. the thing is, I don't go, want go, to interrupt go. you too much, and I'm glad that you wanted to make those points, but I put a load of things in front of you just now, and for example, just go, going to, the, uh, so, so, so the zealot question, right? That was your first one. Are we zealots? That what well, I just well, said well, now well, surely makes about, the yeah. point that this isn't about zealotry. Okay, so let's it's not simply go back about. Me. Let's not go about that. You made that point, and I, and you've made it twice, and I'm with you. Yeah, that is your. It's style. not zealous to want a viable future for my child, right? Sure. No, I'm with you. That's fine. <laughs> so I, it's I, entirely disingenuous I that the media tries your, to portray it that way. I understand yeah. your intellectual argument, and I'm not questioning it. What I'm saying. And is, the emotional, visceral argument, surely as well, right? As a you're parent, you've got me literally there as well. Okay. The, the thing is that um, where I was in terms of where you were going and what I wanted to ask you as well yeah, yeah. in relation to it was to do with, um, I said uh, that there's a degree to which uh, people might say, you know, the government thing. And then you explain that. Uh, you contextualize 1.5 because I was saying Boris says 1.5 and then you started to explain what it really meant. And you said PR will always take elements of truth and amplify in order to mask what they're really doing or not doing. I yeah, get yeah, that. Yeah. I was listening to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, therefore, what we can understand is... Hence the age of greenwash that we're in right sure. now. A so delay in greenwash. Okay, so greenwash, but then we can say, and I agree, that's great that you've pointed that out. But So then we can say that the government is saying the same as you. The government, is, the, the government is using the same language, but basically because there was very successful activism um, it, and, and p a big part of that was the fact that the UN's own scientists that are charged with informing the governments as to what they need to be doing um, made it very, very clear that going beyond 1.5 would be catastrophic. Okay. 
Can I, can um, I, okay, okay, and, hold on. And, and so, so, so that's why that the 1.5 target is there. Everything that is happening in the world is going in an entirely yeah. different direction yeah. towards like three or four degrees. So, yeah, so, so the essence of greenwash is to, is to use the language of 1.5 and net zero, which Kevin Anderson, the climate scientist, has called not zero, okay. because it's basically a pretext for oil and gas and all these things to carry on being burnt on the basis that at some point in the future, we might have come up with sufficient ways to suck carbon out of the atmosphere again to balance out the fossil fuels that we're still planning on burning. So in other words, there's a, there's a scientific truth that has to be addressed in terms of massive material transformation in the interests of the majority of people that would make things you know, fairer, better, more breathable. And, and greenwash and delay is all about taking the language of you know, what needs to happen and dressing it up in such a, in such a way as to try and give the impression that they're doing something. Okay. So, so you, have, you have over the years been um, introduced to my poach, what I call the poach principle, which is the principle of ante anticipated capture and hollowing out. So as activists, we always need to, to anticipate and expect this process to happen where when you know, activists successfully make a point to, to the extent that the public kind of understands that it's a point that needs to be responded to, the powers that be will always take on that language and as far as possible take on the process of change and hollow it out of its effective substance when it comes to actually addressing the powerful interests that stand in the way, right? So, so what they've done with climate change there, don't worry, this activism doesn't need to happen. We're committed to net zero 2050. We're committed to 1. 5, keeping 1.5 alive. Um, you know, we've got this, you know, we've got interim targets. It's all fine. You know, activists can go home. We've got it in hand. Meanwhile, what's actually happening is that they are licensing more and more fossil fuel production. In okay. other words, complete doublespeak. Okay. Uh, in relation to everything that we've been saying, and I haven't addressed the communism, the communism okay. thing yet. No, but no, no, but you you're can welcome. These things you know, yeah, yeah. So, in relation to everything that you've just said yeah. and where we are, I've got two things to throw at you. They're not even going to be questions. It. I'm just okay. going to, and it's open, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, um, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. I believe that's Lenin. Um, and number two um, was to do with. Yeah, where would you put you in relation to the Hegel model of dialectics to do with one truth and then an opposition and then afterwards, you know, they move on to the next thing and the contradiction moving on to the next thing. So go for it. I mean, I think I've always felt that's quite a kind of, it's a sort of... Let's do the Lenin one first. Yeah, so, the best so, way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. In yeah, and, 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 and in a sense, like some, some sort of less, <laughs> I was going to say less Stalinist version, I mean, ironically, like less sort of Leninist version of that insight is the basis of all, you know, bottom up action, right? It's like we need to be the ones demanding the change that's necessary because we know that the, the sooner we sort of give that process of change over to some people higher up that say, yeah, 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 we're going to do it for you, um, you know, chances are. On, on the way that, you know, to, to trying to achieve that, pow your powerful interest will get in the way of that thing actually coming about. So we need to carry on being the authentic opposition to the shit in the status quo that's happening that needs to stop happening. And perhaps most importantly, and I think this is something that we haven't done as a, as a sort of environmental movement, we also need to be telling the inspiring story of a, of a better alternative and, and a means to get there. Um, and I think we've, we're quite good on the, like what the problem is, like the stuff you can do which might help make a difference, but not so good on telling the right story of where we're trying to get to. And actually, the more we tell the story of where we're trying to get to, the more the, the means of trying to get there, i.e. doing the direct action and getting on the media, etc., is likely to be effective. But don't you think that the government <coughs> would be populating your movement with their own people who are there doing the subversion we were talking about? Some people I mean, say you're one of them. You know, so that's what I'm talking about. But, as well. but, but I mean, if you, if, but the point is, I've, I've never had anybody say to me that for this reason, because of the way you're doing things and the way you're framing your activism or trying to make change, that somehow is indirectly benefiting the government. I th I, you know, I just don't think there's an argument for that. Like every, well, I everything, I, think there is. I mean, everything that we're doing is about targeting the government for catastrophic failure and as far as possible joining the dots for people in terms of what is driving that catastrophic failure, i.e., very corrupt, long standing institutionalized revolving door relationships yeah, yeah, between yeah. government and industry i mean you, know, you look at the people who no, you know no, works yeah. for the foreign office and mi5 that sit on the board of bp no, and vice no, versa no, no, and yada yada no, no, no. you know there's a whole cabal i mean there's a that book crude britannia that looked at the way the fossil fuel industry has sort of insinuated itself into the power system in the uk you know these are real these are hugely real significant never that, discussed factors about why we that, seem so stuck on fossil but, fuels but, you know but please let's also think about the idea that some people say 
that the mm -hmm. entire environmental movement is essentially run by the fossil fuel industry. What, what, but, what, to, to be in, to, to be in, to, to be ineffective, you mean, or, or what? I mean, the what's the argument? Quote, the Lenin quote: "The best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves." So you oh, I see what you mean. I, see, I, I didn't understand where you were going with the question. Of course, they will never work because you're in charge of them. You know, so but some people I say Keir Starmer, for example, isn't going to achieve very much because he's on the wrong side, right? This type of thing. I mean, I, you know. The issue of infiltration of, of any movement for change has always been a thing, right? Um, and it's usually at but, the top. But but to suggest that usually at to the top as well. I mean, not not you know, ne so not you, necessarily you that I know the of. No. Case. You know the McLeibel case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It came out that the flyer was designed by police, right? You know, it's this type of thing is that is high, what? high level. Yeah, and also she was the victim of. She, her, Fanny Armstrong. No, Helen Still, but her partner was, um, you know, was a copper as well and disappeared. You know, all of this kind of stuff. Yeah, so this, but this what was the implication spy in spy yeah, but, cops is huge. Yeah, yeah, right. no, totally. But what was the implication in terms? I mean, the the it what was, they uh, were doing with the McLeibel trial was still was still it's an, an it's entrapment. They were basically the whole, you know. Oh sure. The flyer was made oh, by, sure. by police undercover, undercover cops. Oh yeah, it's yeah, yeah, sure. So oh, sure. loads of what you're oh, doing sure. is infiltrated by the state. No, and everything so, is infiltrated, yeah. which which is why it's so important to keep to what is. To keep it working despite that, and that's great. So Satyagraha, right? Truth, truth power, truth power. Like the, the, for me, the, the solution is always to try and speak the truth as much as possible and demand the kind of changes that would be as much as possible, like win-win outcomes no, sure, for the majority of the people, almost, and that that's the best defence against that against that subversion, right? No, like agree. there's always going to be subversion, no, and, like and if the reality of subversion meant that you know inevitably, therefore, any attempt at opposition were, were futile, then we never do anything to try and oppose anything no, because sure. it's going to be George, it's going to be I've interviewed you know. Roger, right? Roger mm -hmm. Hallett. You know, yeah, like yeah. We've hung out a bit. We get on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen the Brages. But um, the idea mm -hmm. of having of doing everything in the open, saying mm -hmm. I'm not hiding anything. Here's what we're doing. I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah, carrying yeah. on. This is this is the type of thing that you're talking about, right? Pretty much. You know, obviously having some strategy, but basically saying you've got to be transparent for people to believe in you, right? And all this kind of stuff. And, but also because there's because you know there's going to be infiltration and stuff like that the more open. the more open book you can be it you know i mean it's like, it's like that, there was that um daily mail article where you know some you know they i mean the media has done quite a lot of things that they try and frame as some sort of like exposés of extinction rebellion and it's basically they're just like somebody's gone to a meeting and like heard what we're saying all the time anyway you know and it just you know it does sort of fall flat i think for that reason to some extent you know and actually, we invited a daily mail journalist who'd written a hit piece like in to come and talk to us and it was just a bit like <laughs> You know where to go with this, you know. Sure. Um, but so I think because you know the powers that be are going to do whatever they can to undermine you, accept that as a kind of working reality. And obviously, if you're sort of planning something that requires clandestine George, George, that, stuff, I mean, you know. I, what you say about accepting it as a as a reality, great. Okay, I'm with you there. But the point is, there's going to be people steering things in that direction. And so, if it oh, they're going to be doing out, their best, right? So to, all you can do is try and keep the movement moving forward in a way that is as effective and and salient as possible but and, and like your homework? You know, the, the, the public the future i don't know yeah, right that's why like we're having this conversation. i mean like, there are a number of th you know i spend my life with nxr for instance you know pushing against certain things that i do think kind of you know make us potentially more complicit with you know problematic things talk so about it. Well, talk well, so, about, talk about so for the, instance the, 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 so one of, so one of the big charges against against ex the likes of extinction rebellion is that by scaring people you get them into a psychological state where they're where because they're afraid they're more likely then to be subject to sort of authoritarian responses sort of eco-fascism right so from that given that that is a, a real danger um the alternative is either not to tell people it's an emergency and that hasn't worked for 30 years because you know unless people are actually like engaged in 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 the world in a way that actually like corresponds to what, what's happening in the world then you you know it's a non-starter if it is an emergency we have to treat it like one so so then the the, the crucial sort of antidote to the eco-fascism is that you are sharing that vision of a much more democratic genuinely inclusive and is much it? more equal society hold on, right hold like on, hold on hold on george much more democratic, much more inclusive. I asked you about who's marking the homework. Which right? is why we're so pushing for participatory me, I democracy. Have no, right, right. I have no involvement with XR. I kind of was yeah, there yeah, at the yeah. beginning and I knew about it before because I know Roger and stuff like that. Yeah, I yeah. would not for one second consider going to one of your meetings unless, you know, I, I just wouldn't. Unless, you know, it's to, it's to film it or something like that. Like, why not? Why not? Because I don't feel very safe in your type of environment 
you know, in those kinds of places. I just don't. So well, I don't, because of the threat of infiltration? No, not just that, but just also just the, the way in which you've got aspects of bullying and hierarchy just come in. It just happens and silencing and it happens just like everywhere else. So for me, I don't. I, I think I think that's a slightly unfair charge. I think but you know that's that, that you're at the top. Well, no, I mean I'm not really. I'm not really. Like I'm a sort of pre-founder, but I've, I've been sort of on the outside in various ways. Like the circle that I'm part of, like has very like arbitrary, <laughs> limited influence. Like the political circle, like you know, might give advice to media messaging or actions or whatever. But whether or not it's taken is you know, it's pretty much sort of up in the air. But but I think in Exile's defence, like a lot about how it's tried to set itself up is to try and resist some of the, the problems with that kind of thing. Like it doesn't have a sort of strict hierarchy that anyone can like get control over. Um, like there's a, there's a constant sort of experimental ideology, if you like, where, where we accept that we're always going to be getting things wrong and we always need to work on improving what we're doing. Um, like I said, I think a, a big antidote to the threat of subversion is to push for the most sort of um, positively radical changes that that are necessary and possible you know if if and and you know there's this what's so unbelievably tragic about this moment in history is that the reason we get called like socialists and communists and you know watermelons and all the rest of it is that as Naomi Klein's first chapter in um this changes everything her 12, 2012 book uh, the the title of that chapter was why the right is right and the point that she was making is that if you accept that there has to be something like a kind of wartime style mobilization what you're talking about is you know you, you accept that the state basically has to have a much more significant role and there needs to be something like sort of a bit of socialism right like you know it's no it's no you know it's no um, secret that what happens in wars when there's wartime style mobilization is that the taxes go up on the very rich like the government basically you know has to coordinate different sectors of the economy um, you know the, the the change that needs to happen is a huge threat to the um, you know unbelievable you know um, independence that financial and corporate powers currently have in the neoliberal structure you know so so that change threatens to significantly undermine the, the current concentrations of power that there are obviously like you know giving power to governments is itself problematic which is why XR has been pushing for participatory democratic mechanisms so that yeah, ordinary, so on that, you know on something that subject, like subsidiarity on, on that subject when people talk about stuff like sortition and mm -hmm. uh, citizens assemblies again to me it just sounds like bollocks um, as in, sortition to me sounds like it's something where you know the result and you engineer it, and uh, citizens' assemblies, okay, I like the idea of people it's listening. It's not as worked in practice, right? Like, no, but I'm just saying I like the idea of it work, you know, people listening to each other, but where's the decision making that comes off the back of that? Oh, sure. I'm not sure. saying that. No, I'm, no, no. I'm, and, I'm not asking you a constitutional and, question. And, and I, would, I would agree with that. Like, I think, I think XR's, I, I wasn't involved in crafting the demands. I do think XR's third demand has. An element have, has elements of sort of silver bullet political naivety to it, as if you can have like one, one citizens assembly, which does what citizens assemblies. Do. I mean, the reason the demand is there is that all the evidence shows, not surprisingly, that when you get a cross section of, you know, 100, 200, 300 people or whatever, that you know that it's democratically, that demographically representative that gets expert input on key issues from people who actually have expertise, sure. rather than from Rupert Murdoch yeah. and his, you know, but his shells framing that point, same issue. But we're to, to finish the point, the the, re, the reason they're effective at being much more progressive in terms of their outcomes than mainstream politics is that those outcomes, because of how the process is set up, um, means that you know the likes of Rupert Murdoch and the vested interest don't get to decide the outcomes like they do in mainstream politics all too much. So that's why. That that's why the push yeah. for that, um, but obviously just having that as some sort of one-off silver bullet thing, where if you know if the government were to set it up, you'd have thought obviously they would try and have as much influence over the expertise that yes. goes into it as possible yeah, to try now. and engineer the result, etc. Yeah. But the but no. committees now are <coughs> supposed but, to be where people give evidence, and it's mm, all it doesn't really come sure out. sure. But nonetheless, what we've seen from citizens assemblies is that every time they've happened on climate, for instance, they propose all sorts of common sense things that activists have been saying for ages, like obviously you should do them like frequent flyer levies and like you know supporting people with the cost of transition to you know to green alternatives you know all these bleedingly obvious things citizens assemblies always say we should do those things because what the the, the reason it's a it's a sort of 
a powerful, it was a powerful tactic to have it included as a demand is because the things that we need to do to address this problem are so common sense and so well understood by experts and would have benefits for the vast majority of people quite apart from not destroying the world that they depend on. Um, but, so, but so just, that's, just, just, you going know, just going but, back but, to decision making then, um, I, I think that your organisation is quite opaque in many ways, but that's mm -hmm. just my, my instinctive take and guess based on my own experiences and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But then also cool. you've got the idea of decision making. And so you can interrupt bits of life, you know, and, and that type of stuff. And that's great. You, you know, it's, it's, it's civilized societies allow for all of that stuff. You do all of that stuff. It's not enough. You keep going. But then at what point are you going to get any change? Because if you don't go to parliament, then we've already got a lot of change. We've already got a lot of change. Sure, what, and unfortunately, too much of that change that is want. being greenwashed. Actual, yeah. So when are you going to get the change that you want? And how's that going to happen? I'm not saying you have to script it, but by stopping stuff now, then where is it going? Are you allying with other forces? We have and no idea. How do you? I mean, well, yes, you have a plan. Yes, yeah, so, so the plan, the well, current so plan no with idea. XR. I don't mean the deets. I mean, you know, I don't mean the dates, but I mm. want to know anything that people can believe is a transparent strategy they can get behind. Um, I mean, the, the strategy is to is to push for the change that's necessary, right? And I think we've yeah, but already. That's, but that's we've, as we've, as we've, the we've, government. That's as big um, as the government. Yeah, no, and I, I personally. You just accuse them of basically being non concrete <laughs> and no. saying, yeah, 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 but not doing it. But you've just done that. I mean, what what we're pushing for is 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 what is scientifically necessary, as opposed to like the the but incredibly do sort it? of double speak but alternative. Are you, how are you going to do it? I guess I mean the, the the current move is for April to try and mobilise. There's a hundred days campaign, which is to try and work. Are you going to win an across... election? Are you going to take power? How are you going to get someone to listen to you that's got the levers of power? I don't know. I mean, I I, I think one of the I, I think to my I, I think one of the big are you yeah the government or not? yeah no no are so you so, by so, banks? so are you the government the so, oil companies people say this stuff okay so so in response to that I I think it is true to say that XR by having this slightly kind of naive um, silver bullet approach to the citizens assembly almost as a as a sort of you know magical way to sidestep power um, was has been insufficiently engaged with the question of of electoral politics and and not being more strategically supportive of the Corbyn movement um, I think was a big mistake and you know there's obviously a significant question there it may be you know a lot of people might say XR being supportive of Corbyn might have been counterproductive in terms of XR's image etc but I think not to have realized that that was an unbelievably vital opportunity to get some genuinely like decent progressive people into power that wanted to do as much as possible to address the crisis as science dictates we must and in a way that is you know fair for people i think that was a huge missed opportunity um i think starmer Interestingly, like on environmental stuff, like that's the one area where he is being like relatively, and I stress relatively, radical in terms of what he's asking for. There's huge, there's huge kind of dirty bits in the detail. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuclear. That's a complicated question, but I'm not, I'm not sure they've been going against the biomass in the way they need to. Hold there's on. There's carbon you say, capture you and storage that, and stuff like that. Are you like saying that, that Starmer's making um, some good demands? No, well, well, Did you just say that? I said relatively speaking, th to say to be going for 2030 zero, zero carbon power relative to other major economies is a radical, is a radical thing to demand. Great British Energy to, to suggest setting up a, uh, you know, Norway style um, state owned company that effectively channels the profits of a massive renewable energy, um, you know, increase in renewable energy into like a sovereign wealth fund and into this company rather than into the pockets of, you know, offshore corporations. Just, just to say I think this, that I think that was that's a relatively good suggestion. Okay, but, but but just can just, I just, to, can, I just, just to, answer that can, can I just finish the point that just I was trying to make, okay. which is that like the, where we're going to get to and how much change we can bring about how quickly, I don't know. But things like Boris Johnson saying, you know, what is it, 85 percent by 65 percent by 2030, the fact that Theresa May um, you know, announced or, or didn't oppose, uh, oh, sorry, did announce a zero carbon 2050 thing. Like we're now mercifully in a point where look, a lot of people have made those, albeit kind of greenwashy commitments. But the fact that it, the UK was the first major country to announce a net zero date was a significant achievement of Extinction Rebellion and reflected the fact that the opinion polls showed that what we were doing radically shifted the, the common sense understanding of climate as an immediate crisis. And so the, the, the role I see for activism, which is not, um, which is not separate. Sorry, I was going to say that I think there's a hugely important role for 
political parties in the current system to bring about change because even if you have a great citizens assembly you still have a party in power that has to use the machinery of government to put into practice so it matters enormously what government is in power but I think that the argument that people have you know many people have heard from very young age where people are told oh well you know you should stop all this activism stuff why don't you like go into parliament where you can really make a difference or go and work for a company where you can affect their environmental policy what activists understand is that unless you radically shift the Overton window of common sense and therefore by extension the, the political demands that are implicitly being made by the majority of people, then you then um, it's very difficult to influence the, the political party machine, especially given our voting system, into the right space. So it's not as if we're sort of naively saying, oh, this activism is going to magically do it instead of politics. It's saying unless you shift the narrative on these things, you know, in the age of information and spectacle, etc., um, then you're not you're not going to create the preconditions for that change to be implemented by a party in power. Um, and I only use the example of Keir Starmer demanding, relatively speaking, radical things um, to point out that those the fact that UK politicians are more radical in what they what they you know what they're doing, even though it's not near radical enough in some cases, and what they're saying that they that they committed to doing is a reflection of the fact that that Overton window has been massively shifted. Obviously it's very easy from a sort of purely you know, sort of quantitative analysis point of view to say, well, show me exactly what the change that you've brought about is. But ultimately, like, you know, any, any activist movement, you can see this over, looking over the last 150 years, is that the, the consequences of, of activism are, are experienced over ensuing decades in terms of how much they succeed in shifting the common sense and how much that then leads to more people being mobilised to the point where more people are taking the kind of action that, that actually creates the meaningful political leverage to displace the power of vested interests, etc, etc. You know. um, so I think it is important that we resist the reductivism because if you're too reductive you can say, oh well obviously there's no point, anything we do they, they just do some bullshit propaganda response to so we might as well give up. You know, we are still at a different, significantly less bad point now than we would we would have been were it not for all the activism. Um, similarly, if the activism had been more radical and mass arrestable and truth telling before 2018, I think we could have got a lot further sooner. Right. Um, OK, so, I mean, it sounds as though the political parties that are in power at the moment can potentially uh, work in a sense in the same sort of direction as what you're pushing for and um, and that's that's something that you're not against uh, you could have got involved in some ways in the past so far it doesn't look like you're going to either um, so yeah achievements in relation to stuff that's gone on and commitments they they're real but at the same time no that link enough. is no that sorry and nowhere near enough like, yeah, they're nowhere near enough, but, but you're not going to step up having an actual interaction with those political parties. I mean, in, in what sense of well, you're interaction not run for and stepping office. up? You're not going to run for office. You're not going to go in I there. mean, Roger, Roger Hallam's tried running for office, right? No, like, we have a very, now. very crappy political system. Yeah, right? but he's not um, the movement. So, so right now... And, and we did a lot of work with, with Corbyn's Labour. We you know, talked to thousands of activists. We were kind of working with Labour for Green New Deal, like, you know alongside etc like you know xr has engaged with that process i just think not not as as forthrightly as it should have done is my view but it's very so it's very very difficult to have that electoral you, influence what's next with you guys getting involved in either the political process or another question that i'm interested in but i know we're going to run out of time now uh, mm. is is the financial process to do with you know banking and stuff like that but that's mm. obviously that's something so for example i saw that larry and money rebellion has been doing i think important things okay i don't know what they're doing you know, i don't know I'll, I'll front, front and behind the scenes I did think, you see you know. what um larry frank of blackrock is they is announcing the activist thing mm. with, with what's uh, what's the latest yeah basically i think he's going to help people uh, vote at uh, annual general meetings of companies so you know you give your money and and so it ends up being managed by blackrock and so basically mm -hmm. they'll say you actually have these shares. You know, they don't just give you money. They say you have stakes in these companies and now we're going to allow you. Being you being who? So let's say Who's you, you? Let's say you have a pension yeah, yeah. or, you know, it's an asset manager. So they run money. Yeah, 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 so yeah, somehow yeah. something that you've got is invested through them directly yeah, yeah. or indirectly. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they're going to allow people to go and vote at AGMs. So as in a pension fund that's invested Something in BlackRock, like that, they, yeah, because they pensions, get some The NHS will go to BlackRock and say invest our money, right? All that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So, yeah. What, so then the NHS would effectively be allowed to be, sort of well, represent that BlackRock. Very interesting question that you've just asked there. 
there's a book called The Rise of the Working Class Shareholder by David Weber. I think I've told you about it before. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned it. He goes it, into that. Yeah, Big yeah. time. It's very And good. who is it that's talking about social, social capitalism I saw recently? Like, not Soros, like, I can't remember. Um, yeah, someone's saying sort of that's the, that's the direction we need to move in. Right, yeah. Um, well, I think that we're probably running out of time for you and me now. I mean, in terms of yeah, the call, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the interview. I'd love to talk to you again um, and, and get yeah, more, yeah, no, see, see how this you know, is received, etc. But um, is there anything that you want to tell anyone before we go? I mean, I, I, I guess, I think, well, so, I mean, just to share, share the idea, and we've talked about this before, but um, there's a, it's a relatively recently departed um, a, a kind of sort of um, so a geographer, economist, I can't remember, um, Ulrich Beck, who used to be at the sociologist. sociologist at London School of Economics, and he had this term, relations of definition, um, which he said to be like the, the you know, in some ways the, the, the dominant um, strain of, or sort of the dominant locus of power in the modern age. Um, so I, so I, I guess, and, and obviously he's using that phrase to, to sort of resonate with the, the notion of relations of production, um, to make the point that so important has the story that, that people are told and they understand and they respond to become in terms of where the world goes. Um, that that is the, the <coughs> in many ways, is the vital battle, battleground the for what actually, for, yeah, yeah, effectively. That that, that is, that, that's, that's the, the space into which you need to intervene most fundamentally, it per chance to bring about the actual material political economic transformations that are required. Um, and I think, you know, Chomsky makes this point that the more, the more formal freedom you have, the more, the more of a democracy you have in theory, the more money, money and power and resource needs to be put into, you know, manufacturing consent effectively. So I think doing things that intervene and like, provoke the informational space in such a way as to prise open these kind of windows of opportunity to actually talk about things that don't get talked about, that really need to get talked about, is very fundamental to the process of change. And I'm not, you know, like I said before, it's not as if that's an alternative to actually you know, getting people in political power that are gonna bring about the change that's necessary, but it is a prerequisite. You know, unless, the, unless you get a, a sufficient um, critical mass of people understanding that there can be no new fossil fuel licenses, there will be new fossil fuel licenses. What right? do you, what do you so, similarly, in terms of a, you know, a, a radical green transformation, ecological and fair, you know, e ecology and fairness based transformation of the global economy, that is the argument that we need to have with people and we need to win it. Okay, and actually, once people up. start believing in that as, as not just some pie in the sky, but actually the necessity that our children depend on, I think that's the tipping point that, we're, that we need to be working towards. Before we wrap up, mm -hmm. what do you have to say to the people in the comments who say uh, just like something really really short two words that indicate that they have n they share no view that you espouse I mean I don't know I it, that's never going to happen right but I think when push, come, push comes to shove divide and rule has been going for thousands of years and and what that system essentially does is try to create artificial division between people that broadly when you get beyond the superficial things probably have a fair amount in common and what almost all human beings alive have in common is that they all want a functional viable world for the for the people they love going forward and what by the way people agree on across the world whether it's you know Russia China America Europe wherever you go um, elites have too much power and most people don't feel they have much influence over the way things really go and would like things to be much better and fairer. Um, and so those things I think, you know, what, whatever people are provoked into to thinking or feeling about, about me, um, that's where we're all at, right? We want a better, fairer world where things are not dominated by a tiny percentage of people that in the process are really destroying the possibility of a viable physical future on this one planet that we know supports life, right? Um, George? That shouldn't be contentious, but, but obviously it has been rendered as contentious as billions of pounds of you know, divisive propaganda can make it. Our job is to, to sort of be that compassionate revolution or just to put it in a you know, much more basic sense, our job is to resist that you know, the tendency to divide and see where we actually all share an interest in a better, fairer world that isn't destroying itself. George, great talking to you. Thank you. You too.